1980, I discovered that my future was in bombs. It was an accident, really, not how I found out, but how I got there. I graduated high school with a high aptitude in math, science, and recreational drug use. <laughs> According to Mr. Cassani, my guidance counselor, who knew me best after our six conversations in four years, I was cut out to major in chemistry. Who was I to argue? About a week before my freshman year of college started, I had a major revelation. Chemistry sucks. <laughs> but that summer, a fr family friend had started his own audio electronics repair shop, hanging around his place, playing with signal generators and oscilloscopes. I, too, quickly became fascinated by waveforms and decibels and the smell of solder. So I switched to electrical engineering. Three and a half years later, I found out that electrical engineers make bombs. <laughs> or radar. <laughs> or bombs that seek out and blow up enemy radar. <laughs> or dummy radar beacons intended to fool the bombs that are seeking out your radar. <laughs> or ways to discern radar beacons <laughs> intended to fool the bombs that are seeking out radar. Clearly, through the Cold War, our national defense strategy was based on methods developed by Wile E. Coyote. <laughs> I discovered this during a series of on-campus job interviews. Defense corporations I had never heard of were recruiting graduating engineers. TRW, Lockheed, Northrop Grumman, Martin Marietta. Until that time, I would have sworn Martin Marietta was Jethro Tull's bass player. <laughs> In an attempt to avoid indoctrination into the US war machine, I signed up to talk to GE and RCA, since I figured they made TVs. <laughs> TVs and bombs. <laughs> I was a left-wing college liberal, politically at odds with the military-industrial complex, not a big fan of mutual assured destruction. And the 80s had arrived. I wanted to join the revolution. Video disc, video that, the coming of digital audio, music synthesizers. But to work on cool shit, you had to be Japanese. We're Americans. We make bombs. Smart bombs. GE touted a bomb that was so smart that it could pierce a billboard several hundred miles away from its launch point. They showed me a video clip of this missile in action during my interview on this new videotape technology, first generation Betamax, Sony, lucky Japanese bastards. <laughs> RCA was developing simulators for training F-18 fighter pilots, an embryonic form of virtual reality before the term virtual reality was an actual reality. Back when virtual reality was just a concept discussed with friends while sitting around a coffee table getting high. <laughs> the simulator, just like the hands-free avionics in the F-18, would allow the pilot to simply look at whatever he wanted to blow up, and through the miracle of modern silicon and a few thousand lines of code, kaboom, virtual rubble. I avoided selling my soul to the emergence of war by convincing the RCA interviewer to forward my application to the video disc division, where I was lucky to get a job, but it only lasted a few years. By 1983, the gravitational pull of the Reagan-era defense spending spree was just too great. That's where the good high-tech jobs were. I finally caved and got a job in San Diego working on satellite data radios for black ops, NSA, special forces. It wasn't bombs, just the secure data communication radios used by the people that launched the bombs. <laughs> Hopefully to keep everyone regularly informed that everything was cool, no need to launch anything. I desperately clung to this rationalization, but I quick, it quickly became very clear that I had cashed in my ideals for a paycheck. It was a trippy job. The engineering geek factor was pretty exciting, but the application a little daunting. I learned that a 
tactical nuclear missile was called a device. And when one went off, that was called an event. <laughs> nuclear war and exchange. Our radios were designed to withstand a nearby event, so the operator, assuming he survived, could request the launch of more tactical devices to continue the exchange. <laughs> Funny thing about black ops projects is they're often hidden in plain sight. They are so classified that they aren't really officially classified so as not to draw attention from enemy spooks sniffing for classified information. That was the case here. But as a matter of procedure, my company required everyone to get a government security clearance. Getting a security clearance is the final act of complicity. You become a full-fledged member of the dark side with a berth on the deck star. Broken and submissive, but well paid, I signed up for my clearance. <laughs> Most of the application the questions on the application were mundane, kind of about as invasive as applying for a car loan, until the drug use history page. <laughs> Working through the rationale, I figured admitting to drug use in the past was not illegal. Lying on the federal form, as it emphatically reminded you in bold letters, was. Since I had been beer only for a few weeks, and the next Grateful Dead weekend getaway wasn't for months. <laughs> Declaring that all my drug use was behind me was honest enough to pass a smell test. And fortunately, this was in the days before the mandatory piss test. The form split all imaginable recreational drugs into five categories. I was a little annoyed at the groupings. <laughs> since I had to check off one box from each fucking category. <laughs> but I held my freak flag high, or at least at half mass. <laughs> I thought this would be the end of it, but my application triggered a follow-up interview by the DOD Investigation Services. Worried, I asked my boss how to handle this. I, I, he certainly knew his way around the bong. He said, uh, I'm as interested to find out what's going to happen as you are. Everyone I know who gets high lied and said no to the drug question. <laughs> Useful information, but a couple weeks too late. <laughs> Suddenly, integrity, though, had wandered back into my corner. Telling the truth about something that everyone routinely lies about had become an act of nonconformity. My DIS interrogator was an army captain in uniform, pretty much Denzel Washington, thoroughly pissed off about being cast in my shitty little movie. <laughs> we ran through straightforward questions about my family history and political beliefs and whether I was a patriot. Then we moved on to the drugs. He asked the same series of questions on each of the nine drugs that I had checked off. When was the first time you ever did it? I was pretty good at remembering the year and sometimes the specific concert or party. <laughs> when was the last time you did it? I had to fudge on this one a few times. Why did you do it? Anyone who has ever snowshoed while doing mushrooms would never ask this question. <laughs> How many times did you do it? Really? I'm 27, a product of the 70s, and you want me to tell you how many times I smoked pot in my life? Your best estimate. I could tell he was having fun with this. Did you pay for it? Do something in exchange for it? Or was it just given to you? It quickly became clear that all of the above, wrong answer for this question. <laughs> I 
Come here, come on, come on, page five. Oh, not again. What's with the fan? All right, here we go. <laughs> After about an hour of reviewing my entire smoking, snorting, and ingesting resume, the captain finally said, now you're required to make a final summarizing statement about your drug use history. <laughs> I thought about this for a minute. As he sat staring at me, pen cocked, ready to write everything down, and this is what I came up with. I assume the reason the government is interested in my drug history here is to determine if it, I can be bribed or drugged as a means of divulging classified or sensitive information. Well, I've told you everything, so there's nothing to blackmail me with. I've never been addicted to anything, nor do I have an urge to do drugs in the future. It was useful, youthful indiscretion on my part. And to be honest, with all of my experience, if somebody dosed me without me knowing, I would be less likely to freak out. I would realize what was going on and just kind of sit back and write it out. I mean, if a bad afternoon on mescaline teaches you nothing, it teaches you this. The captain finally smiled. That's a good one, he said. No one's ever said that before. He made me repeat some of the parts so he could write it down verbatim. And then we awkwardly shook hands and wished each other well. I got my security clearance a few weeks later. And I didn't escape the defense industry until the early 90s. But there was one question he asked about every drug that stumped me each time. In some cases, it kind of haunts me years after the fact. It became part of my arsenal as a father when I talked to my teenagers, teenage sons about drugs. He asked, when you took the drug, how did you know that's what it was? <laughs> I don't know. I guess I didn't. I guess I was just doing what everybody else was doing. Thank you. Eber Lambert, everybody.